Welcome to another video from McFatter Tech Musser. If you like these videos, please click subscribe. 70-740 Lesson 19 Monitoring Server Installations. This will be our last lesson in our 70-740 textbook. What are we talking about? We're talking about managing performance, being able to monitor our performance using task manager, resource monitor, using performance monitor. Now with performance monitor, we can do a lot more than just view. We can take a look at building what we call data collector sets. We can configure alerts. There's much more you can do in Performance Monitor than just viewing what has happened or what may be the current state you can view over time. And then additionally, we're going to take a look at how our Event Viewer can be used to analyze what's going on with our systems and as well as also configuring specific views for that uh, Event Viewer by filtering events. And then we'll also take a brief look at managing services. So why do we do this? Well, the bottom line is for performance. And performance is the overall effectiveness of how data moves through the system. To do this, you have to select the proper hardware, and that's our, our RAM, our CPU, the disk system, the network, and, and what is connected to, of course, the main board to satisfy what we expect our performance to be. Without that proper hardware, you're going to have bottlenecks, and bottlenecks will limit the effectiveness of your performance in your software. When a component limits performance, we call that component a bottleneck. Now, if you relieve one bottleneck, keep in mind that you may create a bottleneck somewhere else. For example, um, for whatever reason, your system has a bottleneck in the amount of memory, the amount of RAM that, that you have. So you go out and you procure additional RAM, you upgrade the memory on the system, and now that's no longer a bottleneck. However, your disk access which is needed to feed data to that RAM, it has a bottleneck. Perhaps the hard drive has a very small built-in cache and it can't feed the information to the memory quick enough now. So it becomes a bottleneck. So even though you have done upgrades making your system faster, your performance might still lack. What do we need to do to be able to find these things. We have to be able to look and find those bottlenecks. Well, if it was not a bottleneck before, how do we know this? Well, we have to know what our baseline performance is. Every system, every network, every design, once it's implemented, needs to have a baseline. How do we know if our networks are performing to their optimum level if we don't know what the normal level is? If you don't know what normal operations are, you won't know when something is out of the ordinary or out of norm. Therefore, you need to create a baseline. You do a baseline analyzation so that you understand what is the expected performance of this server. What are the expected performance of our desktop computers? What is the expected performance of our network segments? You get this by analyzing the performance when the system, whatever that system may be, is running normally and within your design specifications. Therefore, and then when a problem occurs, you can compare that current performance to your baseline to see what's different. Perhaps over time the performance of the disk array has started to degrade. Well, if you have your baseline performance of what that disk array performed as when it was new and as expected, you can see this. This is why we need to have baselines. Now, to be able to analyze your performance, there's a couple tools that are built into Windows operating system. 
And this is important to understand because this could also be something that you're faced with as a question in an interview for a job. If I were to pose the question to you that a user reports an issue with their computer, what are some of the built-in troubleshooting tools that you can use on a Windows system? Your initial response to that question might be, well, I could use command prompt to run various commands to view system configuration. I could use task manager. I could use performance monitor. I could access event logs. These are all tools that are built in to allow you to examine the performance and the state of the system. Let's take a look at Task Manager. Task Manager gives us a quick glance at performance and provides information about programs and processes running on your computer. Understand that a process is an instance of a program that's being executed at that time. Now, to start Task Manager, we simply right click on an empty space on our taskbar and select Task Manager. And you can also get to it by doing the Control Alt Delete and then selecting Task Manager. So, when we first open Task Manager, this is what we see. Or well, this is what's on my system. As you can see, the, the illustration shows an MMC running an Internet Explorer. I've got my video recorder running. I've got an instance of Google Chrome obviously on my screen. Well, I've also got Microsoft Outlook running. And I've got my recorder program where it's going to go to once I finished my recording. If I want to view additional details, I can select more details. And you see here, and this will give us five various tabs to analyze the performance. Now, on their sample they show five. Well I've also got app history and users. Processes is just exactly that. It shows what apps are running, what are the background processes, and the resources that are being allocated to those processes and applications. And then finally at the towards the bottom you can see the Windows processes. These are the critical Windows services and processes. By clicking on a header you can change the sort order. Currently it's sorted by name and app background process and such. If I want to sort it by CPU I simply click on CPU or memory that's in use. Again, I can click on name to resort it as it was originally. If I want to see the a, a graph of the performance, I can click on the performance tab. This gives you an overview of some of the specifications of the system as well. For example, this is an i5-9600K CPU. It's got six cores and six logical processors. Virtualization is enabled. Obviously, I've been using this to give demonstrations in Hyper-V, so virtualization better be enabled. You can see the size of the caches that are built into that CPU. Uptime, threads, and then you can see graphs on the left-hand column to select the various components of the system. For example, this system has 32 gig of RAM. I'm currently using a little over 50% of that RAM because I'm, I'm running virtual machines at the same time. You can see disk access and the performance associated with those disks. You can see your network connection and also your graphical processing and its resources. We can select app history to view what apps have been performing as. On startup we can see what items are enabled or disabled to run on startup of the system. User tab would allow us to view those users who are logged into a system. Under details we can see exactly what apps are running and the PID that is associated with that app. This is important. If we have to kill an app, we could do it from the command line or we could right click and say end task. And then finally services allow us to see an instant view of the services that are running and the group that they're associated with. 
we can see the actual name as well as a description. If we wish to start a service, we could right click and select start. If, if it's a service that's running, we could right click and restart or stop. So this gives us one location where we can view many different performance items as well as doing some maintenance on our system. Make sure you understand all the various bullet points as they go through here. Viewing CPU usage, being able to view working sets and such. Now there's another utility that we can use it's called Resource Monitor. Resource Monitor gives us much more detailed information and it allows us to see what is in use on the CPU, the memory, in our disk, in our network, as well as also software resources such as file handlers and modules and it's all done in real time. Keep in mind that this only shows us real time. It does not give us the ability to see what previously happened. In other words, to be able to look at things over time and do analyzation. This only gives us real time information. If we take a look at Resource Monitor, we can get access to that by simply typing Resource Monitor and pressing Enter, and there it is. Let's make this a little bit larger so we can see a view of it. For example, CPU is expanded. If I expand memory, I can see what's going on with memory. This is an overview screen of our system. However, I can select individual tabs and be able to see detailed information as far as what's going on with each one of the named services, apps, processes, whatever it may be and in relationship to the CPU. If I select memory, I can see those applications that are accessing memory, detailed views, as well as the physical memory in use. Disk shows us what is what activity is occurring on the disk and, and what part of the system is being util, utilized for that disk activity. We can get an overview on the amount of storage that's in use and what processes are associated with disk activity. And then finally on our network tab we can see what applications are utilizing our network as well as what ports may be open and what TCP connections may have been established. And also our network activity for those applications. This is Resource Monitor. Make sure you understand all the different ways that you can use this. Now, Performance Monitor. Performance Monitor is, an, is a little different. It allows us to not only see what's going on in real time, but also to analyze our system performance. It can be opened as a standalone console from our administrative tools. Now we can also run the perfmon from command prompt to open it up. And in fact, I'm, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to simply run perfmon. And there it is. This is performance monitor. But before we take a, a deeper look into that, let's go through our textbook. So it gives us a visual display of our Windows performance counters. And we can do this in real time or it gives us the ability to, to view over time as what we call historical data. We can add additional counters. So initially we may have one view, but we may say this is not the items that we want to view our performance on. We want to change that. By, and you can do that by doing add counters. When we add counters to performance monitor, it allows us to control how and what is displayed. And we do that by right clicking on performance monitor and choosing properties. If we go in here, here's our monitoring tools, here's our performance monitor, and we can go into properties. And here we can say what is the source of the data. We can add additional types of information. 
here are all the different things from your processor that you can add. What about from a uh, physical network interface? All these different things from your network adapters. All the aspects of your system and what controls the performance of that system. There's much that you can do here. Let's take a look at what they're talking about here. We can view the general section and it allows us to adjust the samples. How often are our samples being taken? How much data is being displayed in the graph? And then at that point the graph begins to get redrawn. So the more data you collect, the more you may get a, a better understanding of how your system is running. but that may not fit for what you're actually looking for. You may be looking to say we're going to run this process and then we're going to end the process and we're going to take a look at that historical data. So you may not want the historical data to encompass 20 minutes when you're only examining two minutes worth of historical data. This allows you to control that. The source is that data real-time data or do you want to open up a log file that you previously saved? Perhaps you use this to create a baseline of the performance of the system as it should normally operate. You could then re reload that log file to be able to review that. Your graph you can customize. You can change the appearance and color and the fonts that are used. When we view that graph. There's a couple different ways to view your graph. We can do it as a line graph and that's the default mode. However, you can also do a histogram and that's a bar graph that shows your data. And then you could also specify to do it as a written report. You can change the way that people can access this. If a user needs to access Performance Monitor, they could be added to the administrators, they could be added to the performance monitor users, or they could be added to the performance log users. And make sure that you understand the difference between what these three different groups can do. Determining appropriate counters for storage and compute workloads. What are we talking about? Task Manager, Resource Monitor, and Performance Monitor can be used to view the four primary systems that make up a computer. As previously mentioned, there's hundreds of counters available. We took, we took a brief look at all that listing that's available to you in Performance Monitor. And as you add other services and applications, other counters are made available that allow you to monitor the performance of those applications. Although using all these counters might take some heavy research, you should always start with some basic performance counters to get a glimpse of how that system is running. Remember that your computer is composed of four primary systems. Your CPU or, or your processor, depending on what, how you want to call it, the memory or RAM, your disk, and your network. So if you're going to view your performance, you should always start with those counters. And those counters are processor, and that's percent processor time. And it measures how busy the processor is. Page faults, a paging file percent usage, physical disk percent disk time, physical disk percent average disk queue length. These are all critical counters that should be there by default to start with. Make sure you understand what each one of these will allow you to view. Now configuring data collector sets. Rather than add individual performance counters each time you want to view the performance of a system, you can create a DCS that's a data collector set and this allows you to organize a set of performance counters, event trace data, and system configuration data into a single object that can be reused as needed. So you could create a data collector set for you to get an overview of what you know is the normal performance of your system, your baseline. 
when something goes wrong, you could load that data collector set and review the current performance and compare the two. Our Windows Performance Monitor uses performance counters, event trace data, and configuration information which can, can be combined into those data collector sets. We use performance counters which are measurements of system state or activity. We use event trace data and it's collected from trace providers which are components of the operating system or individual applications that report actions or events. And finally, collection information is collected from key values in the Windows registry. And here's how you go about creating and using a data collector set. You would simply expand the data collection sets and right click the user defined and select new data collector set. Then on the create new data collector set page, you're going to type a name, you're going to create from template, and you're going to click next. And when you're prompted to choose that template, just simply click system performance and then next. Follow through these settings and much of these settings are already there for you. Once you become familiar with them, then you can start to customize your user defined data collector sets. Next, let's take a look at configuring alerts. In Performance Monitor, a performance alert is a notification or task that is executed when a performance value is reached. Performance Monitor can also be used to start certain tasks when a certain counter reaches a particular value. For example, if the processor reaches 90% utilization, you can have Performance Monitor run a command to stop a service or perform some other action in an effort to reduce the burden on the processor. When you configure Performance Alerts, you can perform almost any action you want. You can send a network message or log events into the application event log. You can configure alerts to start applications and performance logs. And here are those steps for doing this. And here again, like many other things, we'll be performing this in our associated lab to this lesson. Let's take a look at configuring and analyzing event viewer logs. Event viewer is one of the most powerful tools you have at your disposal for researching what's going on with the system. It's one of the most useful troubleshooting tools and it's essentially just a log viewer. When you have problems, you should look in Event Viewer to see any errors or warnings that might reveal what the problem is. If a user contacts you, would you ask them to look in Event Viewer? No. You, this is for you to do your research. However, if you're a network administrator and you report an issue to your manager, the first question they may have is, is there anything logged in Event Viewer that you can report? Like so many of our other tools, Event Viewer is a Microsoft Management Console snap-in that enables you to browse and manage event logs. And here again, in our Server Manager, it's available from Tools. It's included in your Computer Management Console as well. It's also an administrative tool. If you wish to execute it from the command prompt, you can type in event vwr.msc and Event Viewer will start. From your Event Viewer, you can view events from multiple event logs, save useful event filters as custom views to be reused. You can schedule a task to run in response to an event and you can create and manage event subscriptions. Now, what they don't tell you here is you can also forward events so that you could have one event log receive those events from multiple systems as collected events. But that's beyond the scope of what we're going to talk about today. When we, when we take a look at understanding our logs and our events, understand that to get the best use of your Windows logs, we need to understand how those logs are organized and how the events are categorized. We can create custom views 
but we can also take a look at the default Windows logs that are created on every system. And this is both on your Windows desktop machines as well as on your Windows servers. Your application log are just what it sounds like. There are events that are logged by applications or programs. Your security log is just what it sounds like. These are logs such as successful or failed or you could also term that as valid or invalid log on attempts. It can also allow you to log access to designated objects like files or folders. Did someone attempt to access a file when they should not have? Folders, printers, and Active Directory objects. Setup is just that. You'll, be, you'll see very few events in there, but these are all events that are related to various application setup. Another large log will be your system log and this contains your events that are logged by all the Windows system components and also any errors that are displayed by Windows during your boot and errors with services. Now as I previously mentioned forward events is where we store events collected from other computers. If you create what's called an event subscription this allows you to collect events from your other servers. You cannot use forwarded events with anything older than Windows 7 or Windows Server 2008, but for the most part, these systems are going out of service anyhow. You may say, well, why would you want to do that? If a system gets hacked, the hacker will in almost all cases want to cover their tracks and hide the fact that they were on a system. How would you do that? Well, one principal way is to wipe the logs. If there's no logs to be able to be examined, you've got no evidence of what they did. By forwarding event logs to a different system, you're eliminating the ability for the hacker to delete those logs. It also allows you to correlate multiple logs to be able to see what's going on in relationship to your overall performance of your network. Now, there's also another section that's, called, that's termed application and service logs. And these are our sets of events related to individual applications or services. So here we could see individual logs for DHCP, DNS, Active Directory, many, many different systems. And let's take a quick look at that. We'll be looking at this in our lab as well. But if we jump into our domain controller, we can take a look immediately. Should just take a moment to log on and we'll be up and going. Right here is Event Viewer. Take a moment for it to lo load. We'll maximize it. And here you can see Applications and Service Logs. Let's go ahead and expand that. Look, App Active Directory Web Services, DFS Replication, DNS Server, Hardware Events, Microsoft. Look here, Windows. And here are all these different types of services and processes that you can drill into for logs. For example, DNS server. If we have auditing enabled, and we do, we can see exact information regarding the DNS server itself. Right here, look, resource record was created. A dynamic update occurred. System and process and application specific logging, as well as those application and security logs and so on. So here we can see log off, log on. A lot of valuable information coming out of Event Viewer. When we're taking a look at an event, you're going to see a log name, a source, an event ID, a level, sometimes user. Some, you'll see log the details as far as date and time, the system that was accessing it or, or was accessed, and in other words, the computer, as, much, as well as a lot of other information. 
when we want to take a look at that, we can filter those events. So as you saw in that Windows Domain Controller, there's many, many, many events. It's critical to view the events that are relevant to what you want to see. Therefore, you need to know how to filter events so that you can focus on that specific information. For example, you could filter an event log by critical events only, or only warnings, or a specific event ID, or the category, for example, law, uh, audit success or audit fail, different, different ways. Let's take a look at the event viewer on my desktop system. If we go into our Windows logs, and for example, security, I can, on the right hand column here, select filter current log. And I could say, I want to see keywords audit failure. And if I click OK, there have not been any failed audits. So I could clear the filter, the filter, and then I could select filter current log again. Perhaps I want to see something related to classic. And I would click OK. Well, here again, nothing. I clear the log. Let's go to application. I want to filter, and I want to see warnings. I click OK. Now we can see all the warnings that are related to this system. Filter the view to see your relevant information. And here are the steps that you can go through to do that. Now, the other thing that you can do is you can create a custom view. So here you can see this is where this, this would be at, and I've got a couple of them already created. To do that, on the right-hand column under Actions, you would select Create Custom View. You would give a specific time period. Perhaps you only want to see events that occurred in the last 24 hours that were critical or warning in nature. And you could say what the source was. You could select by source or by application. We could say all event IDs. In this case, this would give me all critical and all warning event levels in the last 24 hours. So let's go ahead and we're going to click OK. And we're going to say critical and warning 24 hours and click OK. Now we can see immediately any critical events or warnings in the past 24 hours. If we say we no longer want this, we could right click on it and delete. Now managing services. A service is a program, a routine, or a process that performs a specific system function to support other programs or provide a network service. A service runs in the system background without a user interface. Some of our examples could be our internet website, the worldwide publishing services, server services, workstation services, and our Windows event log services. If we want to view those, we can type in from our command prompt services.msc. What you see here is a misprint. You cannot execute mmc space services.mmc to get the services console. From the command prompt or the run box, you would type in services.msc. And that would bring up the same dialog. You can get to it from tools, or you can get it from get to it from the computer management console, or you can get to it from your administrative tools. There's many different ways. 
on each one of those services just like you can in task manager you can right click and you could start the service you could stop the service you could restart the service however in the services console you also can view the properties and be able to change the startup type perhaps it's a startup type that's disabled you could change it to manual so that you would have the ability to start it when you wanted or you could start it automatically or you could specify automatic with a delayed start. What's the difference between automatic and automatic delayed start? Well, some system services must start when the computer starts. They need to be set as automatic. And this will be done, this will be done by the system. However, some services may not need to be running as the system comes up. In other words, it's a it's a service that's going to run once the server has started. So it could be on a delayed start. It's not critical to the system being operational. And here is the description for all four of those. Specifies that the server should start automatically when the system starts. That's the computer. Delayed start, start automatically after the services marked as automatic have started. And it's usually about a two minute delay. Manual is just that. It has to be started by a user. Disabled disables the service from being started, period. Now you can also use PowerShell to start, stop, and restart these services. And here are those PowerShell commandlets. There's different ways for you to run services. You can run it as a local system. You can run it as a local service from the NT authority. You can also run it as a network service. This does three different things. Understand those three different levels. Now, finally, let's take a look at viewing the logon tab. And if you look up here, that's that tab right there, and that's where they're talking about this, the way that it runs. Take a lot of care if you're going to change the startup parameters for a service. And this includes that startup type and the logon type. If you change the logon type settings, you may prevent key services from running correctly. There's a, another option, this one right here allow service to interact with the desktop. Microsoft specifically recommends it do you do not change that setting because that would allow the service to access any information displayed on the user's desktop. If this were to be enabled, a malicious user could then take control of that service or attack it from the interactive desktop. As a general rule, you should use the account with the minimum rights and permissions for that service to operate. This is part of the what we call the principle of least privilege. Only having the rights to do what you need to do. Or in this case, only having the rights necessary to do what a service needs to do. If you install Exchange and SQL on a server, you should have a service account for Exchange and a, another service account for SQL. These are also accounts that would never be logged on to. In fact, they should be specified that they are not available for logon. They need to have complex passwords. If you're new to Windows administration and configuring Windows, click on each service. Read the respective description for each one of those services. Become familiar with them. There's many services that you'll have to access on a regular basis. There's many services that you, will, you may never have to access. But you still need to be familiar with what those various service names are and what their descriptions are. In this section, we took a look at what performance is and why it's important to have baselines so that we can understand what the performance of our system is and whether it's normal or out of the norm. We took a look at Task Manager, Resource Monitor, the ways that you can customize Performance Monitor, and then finally we delved into Event Viewer 
to see how we can really take a look at what's going on in our systems. Finally, we took a look at how our services work and we briefly took a look at how services can be configured for their startup and how they're able to access a resource. Thank you for reviewing 70-740 Lesson 19. And as I always say, I'll see you in the next Labber Lesson.